Hey you, it's me, V, one of the editors of Media Mementos and your resident Fanimaniac. It's no secret how much I adore Animaniacs 1993. Enough for me to have a talking spotlight centered around Animaniacs on this channel three times. Four if you count right now. So, you've read the title, let's get into it. While yes, this is my favorite show of all time, I wouldn't call it perfect. Although I love the Warners with every fiber of my being and enjoy Pinky and the Brain, Slappy Squirrel, The Good Feathers, Rita and Runt, Minerva Mink, and even Chicken Boo, not all of the skits are winners. There's a small portion of skits that I think are pretty weak for one reason or another, but there's one in particular that I never hesitate to skip over. The weakest of them all is none other than Katie Kaboom. Katie Kaboom is an interesting case compared to most other sketches. She wasn't part of the original lineup. In fact, if you look at the intro, she's nowhere to be found in the group shots. Katie Kaboom was a last minute addition to the show because in case you missed our Minerva Mink video in February, Minerva's sketches were too risque to keep around and although she remained a prominent character due to her roles in crossover segments, her solo skits were cut from the lineup. They needed another sketch to fill the void, so Katie Kaboom was tacked on and clumsily inserted into Animaniacs. Just like Minerva, her debut was not in her own skit. She was paired up with Chicken Boo of all characters in Animaniacs Stu, which ironically happened to be her best appearance. She quickly became a common choice for many people's worst characters and sketches list, including my own. Now that's a lot of damage! That's how much she failed, and it's about time we discuss why. Katie Kaboom is about the titular character, a teenage girl who lives in a house with a garden in bloom. She has a mom, a dad, and a little brother named Tinker who dresses exactly like Wacko just because he can. Katie seems like a nice girl at first, but she has a horrible temper. Whenever she gets angry, she literally turns into a monster and brings terror to everyone around her until she calms down. Many of Katie's problems as a character are the reasons why her sketch is so unpopular. The most notable problem is that her anger issues fail to be funny and come off as rather cruel because the only recurring victims are her parents and brother. A common writing tactic in Animaniacs is that whenever the characters have to face off against an antagonist, said antagonist should deserve it to some extent. For example, Dr. Scratch and Sniff is not a full-on villain. He's just a man doing his job and someone the Warners also became very attached to, so it comes off more as teasing compared to when they're pitted against genuine jerks like Thaddeus Plotz, Mr. Flaxseed, Ivan Blosky, or even Death himself. And in Slappy's case, not only are her enemies the ones who start the fight, but they also have more explicit tune violence occurring. With Katie, neither of these apply. If the other Kabooms were smothering her, Katie's rage would have been more understandable and perhaps warranted to some degree. Turning this into a satire of family dynamics instead of just teenage girls, but this isn't the case. Katie explodes on them for things like not letting her wear a crop top, not answering a phone call for her, stopping her from pulling an all-nighter after prom, or telling her that her boyfriend is a giant chicken in which she has a double tantrum when her first one reveals Chicken Boo's identity and then she gets angry at him, which is why I consider Katie Kaboo to be her peak. Sometimes she's triggered by their attempts to help her, like reassuring her that having a pimple is no big deal or making sure she remembers the basics of driving before taking off after getting her permit. Or even something that isn't their fault, like when her date's late to pick her up and she doesn't hesitate to take it out on them when she thinks she got stood up. Although Katie's monster forms are creatively designed and pretty wacky, the violence in her skits feels more realistic compared to the other examples previously mentioned. The two most notable examples of this are The Broken Date and The Driving Lesson, the former showing Katie directly attacking her innocent family with lasers, fire, and all the knives in the kitchen, while the latter has Katie put her entire neighborhood in danger with her reckless road rage. In both scenarios, it's not far-fetched to think that she could have killed them all. At this point, it's not just her parents and Tinker. Nearly everyone is absolutely terrified of Katie, and it takes the last short for Mr. Kaboom to finally stand up to her by negotiating a way too flexible curfew for her. 
Otherwise, can you really blame them when they're constantly on thin ice and subjected to their daughter being so enraged that she not only turns into a monster but causes collateral damage, puts innocence in harm's way, and on multiple occasions leaves their house in shambles? It's hard to look at Katie in a sympathetic light when any little thing can be enough to make her go monster mode or, even worse, killer monster mode. It doesn't help that since her segment's main focus is making fun of teenage girls, heck, her creator was inspired by his own daughter, which low-key raises red flags. Teenagers should be locked away until they're 30. Excuse me, why? Her nasty side is 90% of what we get from her. She seems to be an otherwise nice girl who's ignorant about her destructive temper tantrums, but that's just a bare-bones personality. However, there is subtle evidence that suggests Katie is fully aware of her condition and the harm it brings to others, but chooses to be ignorant so she doesn't have to face the consequences of her actions. For instance, in the short where Mr. Kaboom talks Katie down for that prom curfew, we get to actually see her turn back into her human form and she happily ends the conversation, this time being a direct continuation instead of one that's left on a vague note. When we look at her previous episodes with this knowledge in mind, Katie never seems to regret her actions and she doesn't apologize for her outbursts a single time. You gotta be kidding me. At her worst, she's a monster in every way who has no problem with her transformations hurting everyone around her. But at her most likable, she's the one bland member of a colorful crew. And when the skits are even more strictly formulaic than Chicken Boo's, it makes it hard to talk about her as much as the rest of the characters in the show. I don't think the crew liked Katie too much either, because not only did she get a measly seven skits across a 99 episode run, but also, compared to her co-stars, she's not a prominent character in crossover sketches. I can't even remember one where she appears at all. And of course, as we've covered in our Minerva Mink video, Katie is skipped over entirely for the Macadamia Nuts song, which is hilarious when you realize she was snubbed in favor of Pip, Wally Llama, Colin, The Mime, and Chicken Boo. Even Rita and Runt, whose skits were cut after season one like Minerva's, got bigger roles than Katie. Which is a shame because that could have been a good opportunity for them to show us more of Katie outside her hair trigger temper. Kind of like how they constantly brought Minerva back as a team player after her sketches got cut. Maybe she could have used her anger against enemies who actually deserved it and protected the people around her. For once, she'd be actually likable. Alternatively, Katie could have been a recurring villain. What if, like in her final episode, she's aware of how her anger hurts the people around her and uses it to get what she wants? That'd make her the chaotic evil to Dot's chaotic good and Minerva's true neutral, serving as a deconstruction of their routines. It also would have worked in her favor since in this scenario, she's someone we're supposed to hate. Surprisingly, a third way to fix Katie can be found in, of all places, the comics. The plot structure is considerably different in the comics, and so is Katie's characterization. In her two most prominent appearances, we see her actively trying to hold back her temper. It takes her being pushed to an actual breaking point to explode, as we see when she returns home after a crappy day at school, or when her bridezilla of a cousin who's been yelling at everyone pushes Katie to fight fire with fire. While the former only shows the house blowing up, the latter features Katie and her cousin going monster mode, and since it's a longer strip compared to the four-page school day adventure, we also get to see the writers expand upon the show incarnation's biggest weakness. While the two girls are at war with each other, they overhear their fathers bonding over how they're all grown up now, and they turn back to normal as they hug each other, move to tears. It's pretty sweet, and also a really funny way to get them to calm down. Plus, their anger being more directed at each other instead of the innocent bystanders helps. I wish this could have been in the show proper because it feels a lot less mean-spirited and more clever than haha, teenagers are monsters, but by that point it was far too late for course correction. When you think about it, the crew wrote themselves into a corner. Katie Kaboom was doomed to fail. There's nothing charming, funny, or positively compelling to her. When she's not terrorizing innocent people without remorse, she's a bland stereotype nobody cares about. In a way, she symbolizes what could have happened if Animaniacs was a failure. It isn't enough that Katie's humor is tone deaf, but she's so unmemorable that when you don't outright forget she exists, talking about her often feels like a broken record. 
Other less beloved characters manage to hit their stride at some point, like the Hip Hippos turning out to be great team players despite their mediocre solo skits, and Minerva Mink dominating every appearance she's made in the comics when her solo skits were cut. But by the time Katie got fixed, it wasn't able to carry over to the main product. With all the cards against her favor, her skits churning out a short-lived train wreck, and her couple of comics being so obscure nobody remembers what could have been, it's no wonder why Katie Kaboom is the weak link of Animaniacs 1993. Well, that's all for now. What did you guys think of Katie Kaboom? Is she one of the worst skits that ever came out of Animaniacs? Or is there some method to her madness? Comment below, because we all want to know what you guys have to say. And now, it's time for the Patreon Roll Call. The Masters of Fate are Chan Eleven, Drew the Stew, and Kevisic. Manny Paredes, MD the Dude, Platinum Base Quiet Chap, Ryan Williams, Tommy and Woody Woo, now onto the executive producers, Aaron Vasquez, Albert Robinson, Blackjack and Nature Huffman, Indiscreet One or Sinus, Ravioli Supremo, One Kale, and who else but Zane? If you want to join, click and donate below so we can thank you all the same. And consider joining our Discord server too, also linked below. It's time for me to go back behind the screen, but if you're interested in more spoken content from me, then take a look at my channel. Until next time, this is V, putting the V in lovely lively V, and signing off. Good night, everybody!